So good morning for our West Coast attendees and good afternoon uh, for those attending on the East Coast. Welcome to the second Transformational Speaker Series webinar. This webinar series is a partnership between the California Green Academy, Island Press, and Transportica. The series is a monthly webinar addressing transformational ideas and innovations in transportation design and delivery. For more information, you can visit www.calgreenacademy.org slash transformational. Today's speaker is Professor Karen Firehawk of the University of Virginia's School of Architecture. She will be discussing her landmark publication, Strategic Green Infrastructure Planning, and the need for transportation planning and design to be grounded in green infrastructure principles. Besides being today's speaker, she is also the August author for Transportica's book club. And this is the first time an author has also been asked to present on their publication. During Professor Firehawk's webinar, attendees may post their questions in the chat feature and myself or Jen Haas will relay this question to Professor Firehawk. If you're joining us via telephone, you can send your inquiry to our Twitter handle at transforming and then the letters TCA or via email at transformational at calgreenacademy.org. Again, that email address is transformational at calgreenacademy.org. To begin our webinar, please let me turn over to Jen Haas, Partnership Manager for Island Press, the publisher of Professor Firehawk's book. Jen? Hi, Greg. Thank you very much. Um, first, I'll give an introduction of Island Press very briefly and then introduce uh, Karen Firehawk. So um, thank you all for joining us. Um, Island Press uh, began with a simple idea that knowledge is power, the power to imagine a better future and find ways of getting us there. Founded in 1984, Island Press's mission is to provide the best ideas and information to those seeking to understand and protect the environment and create solutions to its complex problems. Island Press elevates voices of change, shines a spotlight on crucial issues, and focuses attention on sustainable solutions. Our programs and partnerships bring our authors and their views into a conversation with people who can trigger change on the ground and keep it moving forward. Um, and today, our speaker is Professor Karen Firehawk. Um, Ms. Firehawk is an environmental planner uh, with more than 26 years of experience in natural resource management. She's the director and co-founder of the Green Infrastructure Center and oversees green infrastructure planning and research projects. Since 1999, she has served on the adjunct facility I'm sorry, faculty at the University of Virginia and teaches graduate courses in green infrastructure planning, watershed planning, and stormwater management and global health and environmental ordinances and fundraising. She has authored numerous handbooks, such as A Local Government's Guide to Stream Corridor Protection and Collaboration, a guide for environmental advocates, as well as guides for wetland conservation and watershed planning. She has won local, state, and national awards for her work, such as the National Greenways Award for her River and Wetland Conservation and the Virginia River Conservationist of the Year Award. She and her graduate students also won the award of Design Professionals of the Year for the Charlottesville Comprehensive Plans Environmental Sustainability Chapter in 2007, um, created as part of the P PLAC Place 550 Green Cities Green Lands class. Students in her watershed planning class also won an award for the Virginia Planning Association. Ms. Firehawk is active in community planning issues. She has served as chair of the Charlottesville Planning Commission and served on numerous environmental committees at the local, state, and national levels. Thank you for joining us today, Ms. Firehawk. Uh, please begin. Thanks very much, and it's great to be with everyone virtually. So I'll uh, just begin by noting the cover slide shows you uh, several different forms of transportation. People are moving through the landscape on pathways, there are roads, and then there's another form of transportation, which is how wildlife moves through the landscape. 
So today we're going to talk broadly about different ways of movement and ways that transportation planners can also help facilitate that. I'm going to define green infrastructure so that we all can get on the same page and talk about some of the nuances and definitions. I'm going to talk about mapping green infrastructure in rural and urban environments. So I'm going to do a very broad rural example and then a very urban example. So if you're rural or urban, there'll be something for you. And then I'm going to just go over some examples. So as was stated, uh, I run the Green Infrastructure Center and I wanted to give a quick overview of how that began. I actually was teaching a planning class in 2006 using that idea of green infrastructure as a way to help local governments understand that nature is part of our infrastructure and needs to be planned for. And the project was so successful that I tried to think, well, how can I do this class every year? And I realized that I might be long dead by the time I got as much work done as I wanted to. And so I formed a nonprofit called the Green Infrastructure Center to help facilitate that work. I still engage students in my projects, but by forming a center, I also have a host of other environmental professionals that uh, we work with. So we work across the U.S. and we build landscape models. We teach courses and workshops. We do research into new methods, and I'll tell you about a couple of projects going on as part of this webinar. And we also help create community plans at the local level, so working very much at the grassroots level with cities and towns and counties. And if you want to learn more about our work, you can go online later to GICINC.org where we always post our materials for free. And of course, uh, Island Press is helping to facilitate this work. And one way they helped us greatly was by publishing this book, Strategic Green Infrastructure Planning, which talks about thinking at multiple scales. So a lot of what I'm talking about today, you can learn more in this book. I'm not going to cover the whole book in one webinar. Um, but the webinar will allow me to show you some visual images that are difficult to show in a print medium. And so I think that's why it kind of makes sense to have both the book as well as the webinar experience. And I've also posted here a discount um, that you can get for the book if you're listening to this webinar. So a quick case example, just to give you a flavor of the scale of our work. Uh, we, in urban landscapes, here's an example of Somerville, South Carolina, a bedroom community of Charleston. And they uh, were actually used to be a place to go and experience nature away from the city. And now, of course, it's many people's homes and they're trying to bring that nature back and to restore their urban forest in the context of their history and culture. Hot Springs, Arkansas, a city nestled inside of a national park. And it looks beautiful in the photo we took from above but they also have issues with uh, transportation planning, blight, access, movement, and so we created a plan for them to help re-green their, their roads. And they've also taken a number of their parking lots that they didn't need and turned them into parks. Jersey City, New Jersey, I threw that in because it's an example of one of our projects in a super dense urban environment suffering from damages from Hurricane Sandy, so we worked with them to help develop tree canopy goals for the city. And Richmond, Virginia, which is a post-industrial city with lots of empty warehouses, and we helped them to figure out how they could reconnect and re-green the city. And that picture is a picture of us building an arboretum that we designed for the Veterans Hospital. So just to get into definitions, infrastructure, what's in a name? Well, all of us know generally what gray infrastructure is, roads, power lines, pipelines, um, facilities, all of the things that we need for civil society. So green infrastructure is taking off on that notion by reminding us that just as we plan for gray infrastructure on the left side of the screen, we also need to plan for green infrastructure on the right. So on the right side, we're showing that same image, but we've added the land cover which is the tree canopy, the water, the wetlands, all of the natural elements that are also vital to keeping that city livable, healthy, and vibrant. One way to think of it, green infrastructure is to think of it as our natural assets. And just as any C 
city would know what's in its portfolio in terms of land that it owns and manages, facilities that it owns and manages, their worth, their condition. We also need to know the condition of the natural assets that our communities have, whether it's agricultural soils, forests, beautiful views, water, meadows, all of these different habitats are also part of our infrastructure because they're providing clean air, clean water, recreation, and habitat for us humans as well. These resources also support culture and history. So on the bottom left, there's a scenic road. That wouldn't be a scenic road, of course, without the scenery. Um, thinking about Civil War battlefields here in the east, thinking about wineries, and the views that they depend on. And so all of these cultural and historic things are also supported by the landscape in which they sit. So we very much map those and buffer those and include them in our analysis of the sort of natural cultural components of a community. The term green infrastructure actually originated in the state of Florida. A long time ago, 1994, the Florida Greenways Commission was working on a report and they were trying to explain to their governor that nature is part of our infrastructure. And so nature and infrastructure come together in places like the Everglades, the river of grass that filters and flows so much of the landscape of Florida, the forests of the Western Panhandle, Lake Okeechobee, and the many marshes, wetlands, and bays and other habitats of the state. The, that idea of green infrastructure really stuck and they were able to create a model of the state's natural habitats and they actually then used that model to prioritize funds to acquire land for trails and recreation as well as for habitats that were sensitive and needed protection. So I'm sure many of you on this phone call have and this uh, webinar have heard of green infrastructure as things such as rain gardens or bioswales, permeable pavers, filtera boxes, those type of structures that use green elements in them. So they started becoming called green infrastructure in 2006. So as I said, 1994, Florida coins the definition to refer to natural elements. In 2006, EPA also added best management practices such as rain gardens to the definition. So how we consider these are as constructed green infrastructure. In other words, uh, something that you manipulated or grew or designed to try to replicate nature's functions. So what we want folks to do is to first consider their natural infrastructure, trees, forests, rivers, protect and connect them, and build in the least impactful manner, and then mitigate. And why we bring this up is that we find it's very common for someone to clear the land of all the trees, and then build rain gardens to soak up the water from the trees that the trees are no longer functioning as doing. So in other words, we want to conserve the natural resources first and let them do their job, build in a small footprint, you know, uh, skinnier roads, less parking, and then we have more room for those natural functions to exist. So first, conservation than mitigation. When we don't plan well, of course, we have traffic congestion and roads that are overfilled, water quality impacts from runoff, air quality impacts, loss of critical habitat, loss of working lands. And while you viewed this slide, America lost another three acres of open space. I determine that by how long it takes me to say that slide and the national rate of land loss. So the notion here is that we need to have very thoughtful land use planning so that we can conserve these resources. So often as counties are planning, they're thinking about where should they develop. I'm sure everyone on the phone is familiar with the notion of smart growth, using existing green infrastructure to guide growth and development. So building close to where you already have a road network uh, taking advantage of proximity to towns or wastewater treatment plants or other facilities. But is that enough? Is smart growth enough? Typical plan that we see in a rural county is they will take the county and divide it diagonally and save half and build on the other half. 
Well, that approach is simple. It does not conserve our best resources because it's not being done outside of the context of where resources are actually located. So we need to consider where are all the assets? Where are the wetlands, the roads, the towns, the farms? So we can be gray and think of gray and green and be smart and green at the same time. And I bring this up because we often see localities designating farming areas, for example, without actually realizing that the good agricultural soils were in the area they designated for growth and the poor soils are in the area designated for agriculture. So we really want to make sure that we use good, smart, sound data in our planning. And the other problem that we observe is that a lot of times people want to conserve green and that's a good thing, but they don't think outside their parcel boundary. And so we see a lot of green developments where they have green in the development, but it connects to nothing. And so here's an example of three subdivisions where each connected some green space or actually protected, excuse me, protected some green space, but it doesn't connect. We can keep that space connected, but we have to think at a larger scale. <clears throat> and so perhaps that means that on the left side, we don't develop, that turns into a park or a conservation easement or other open space. We have moderate level of development in the middle and more intense development on the right where I have room to maneuver. So we're not suggesting that we cannot grow. What we're suggesting is that we need to be a lot smarter about the patterns of growth and of course, the smarter we are with that, the less of a road network we have to build. We need roads, of course, but we don't want to waste topography building excessive amounts of impervious service. So <clears throat> quickly to sum up, what's the difference between green infrastructure versus traditional development? In traditional development, we plan for the gray infrastructure first, the roads, the stormwater pipes. In green infrastructure, we assess the natural features and functions and protect them first. In traditional development, we put our green spaces in the leftover lands. We make the recreation areas of floodplains or the cliffs. In green infrastructure, we plan for parks, trails, habitat connections before laying out the buildings. In traditional development, we work within the confines of a parcel. We end up with pocket parks, inner trails, and gated systems. In green infrastructure-based development, we connect the land and water to habitat, to the region, and across ownerships. So it's a much more expansive way of thinking, planning, and building. So I'm going to just talk quickly about some of the benefits that green infrastructure can provide in the city. So let's think about trees for a moment here. Of course, they clean the air, they remove vault organic compounds, and they cool the city. Well-being and mental health, people heal faster, up to 30% faster if they can see or access green. So if you're sick for the day, look outside and see that green. If you're in a hospital, you want a room with a view. Less crime occurs near trees. People exercise if they can access green where they work. People shop longer and more often in tree-lined areas and spend about 12% more. These are just some of the examples of the statistics that I cover in the book that we wrote with Island Press. So if you want to know more about this, there's a whole chapter on these arguments. And then companies, especially those with a well-paid and skilled workforce, place a strong importance on the green of the local environment. So we have seen towns and cities that are not large, not necessarily having a big budget, outcompete other larger, more wealthy cities for jobs because they offer more green space, more recreation, and a healthier lifestyle. Clean and green lifestyles have really become important. So in budgeting for street trees in the city, remember that they will pay you back in more tax revenue from shopping and dining, lower vacancy rates, our occupancy rates, et cetera. So as we think about green infrastructure and connectivity, there are some key ecological elements I want to teach you about. First, we have habitat cores. Those are those large chunks of landscape uh, that are relatively intact and uh, somewhat hom homogenous. And then we have the corridors that connect them. So when we're thinking about green infrastructure planning, we're really thinking about it as a network of habitats that are linked together. And I'm gonna cover why that's so important. So first let's begin with the definition of a habitat core. As I said, it's a similar landscape type that is not overly bisected. And you don't need to worry about the map on the left. Essentially what we'll do for a forested landscape is we'll take the height of the average tree and we'll multiply times three, and that will be the area of edge 
we then subtract the edge from the outside, that sort of that distance. So let's say it was a really tall tree and it was 100 feet average tree height. We'd multiply times three and that would be 300 feet we would subtract. That tells us what's edge, where invasive things can get in. And then we ask how much land do we have left in the middle? And if it's at least 100 acres, we call that a core. It's getting to be large enough for many species to thrive and survive. Core shape does matter. So if you have something, for example, such as this long and skinny linear habitat here, or this one on the far right that has a funky shape, you notice that when we add in all the edge, there's not much left that can be interior. And we need that interior space to protect the wildlife that live there. We also look for lots of fingers for entry and exit. So if you've ever done safety planning, you know, need to have more than one entry and exit. And so it's the same for wildlife. The more pathways they have, the more uh, biologically uh, sustainable that core can be because they can replenish the supply, genetic diversity, foraging for food, mating, etc. Edge of the boundary also matters. So it turns out, and this has been done by, you know, wildlife callers and other ways of monitoring wildlife movement, that a more linear edge, a more long edge, facilitates up and down movement, whereas a more curvilinear edge facilitates more movement in and out of the core. And uh, so messy edges are better is the takeaway from that if you want to have good biodiversity and wildlife movement. And so I'm going to show now how we determine whether a landscape is an intact. And the first thing we begin with is I ask, what is fragmenting the landscape? And so here, these are the things that chop up the landscape. Pipelines, power lines, rail lines, and roads. So this is showing a real location. So these are all the things that are going on there. And then we add the land cover. So now we have all land cover and all the fragmenting features. But what is left to become a habitat? Well, we can model this through a very, series of algorithms and come up with these areas, these dark green areas, those are the areas that are not bisected too much and are at least 100 acres in size. And you can also see here that you can have a hole in the donut. It's okay to have some room in there. And how we figure out the corridors is that um, it uses an algorithm to chug across the landscape using least cost path analysis to look at the areas where we have low elevation. And so this is what it's showing where lighter colors are uh, lower elevation. And so the model will select that. All right, so that's a lower elevation, easier pathway for wildlife. And then it goes ahead and puts in that sort of pathway across the landscape. It does also try to avoid crossing large roads. It finds a way to go under it will. Um, but what I always like to point out is it's only a model. These type of least cost path analyses, and it doesn't read your transportation plan. It has no idea what your five-year road network will be like. And so it's really important that people take a look at this and then modify as necessary. The more edge we have, the more impact zones we have. So we're concerned with having too much edge. And so when we think about roads, um, as we put roads through these habitats, we create that extra area of edge, and we've now taken something that was a large habitat core and bisected it. So it's really important to think about road planning, if you look at a map of where your cores are, to try to perhaps go around or avoid them. And one county we worked with in Virginia, after finishing their mapping, they pledged not to bisect any cores in the future, especially their highest ranked ones. Why does edge matter so much? A lot of different species come in and take advantage of the edge. And I've just picked out one example here. This is the brown-headed cowbird, and it parasitizes other birds' nests. So you have examples such as the least belled vireo and the willow flycatcher are now listed as endangered in California due to loss of their riparian habitat and that nest parasitism by this cowbird. It lays its eggs in the other bird's nest and it, they hatch sooner. So it does matter if we have too much edge and we try to avoid those opportunities for things to get in and cause trouble. We need to create that secure interior habitat. Also, if you have a messy edge, nature likes messy. And so in this example, 
Um, we've shown you, you know, a sort of straight edge you might see at the edge of a field um, versus that um, edge that you have different sizes and structures of vegetation. And that facilitates uh, wildlife such as the California quail, um, which it really does like to live. It will go out in the field, but it really likes that forest edge habitat. It's a sort of uh, for preference for that. So the more of this type of messy edge you can create, the more habitat you can create for quail and other birds. Corridors across the landscape, of course, are not uniform. Wildlife are using them to move. 300 meters wide is a sort of good minimum width, so it gives about 100 meters in the middle for wildlife to have safe passage. Who uses the corridors? Well, wildlife, birds, plants, pollinators, and people. And when we don't have a nice corridor connection, even if we can have a set of cores or smaller habitat patches, they can serve as stepping stones for things to flip, fly, creep, crawl, and move across the landscape. When we lose some of those stepping stones, we can have species go extinct or in one area. So here, let's say a storm happened and damaged these two habitats and, the, and this one here, and then there's more damage. Now we can't cross pollinate. We can't get back to that area. It's too far away. So we try to think about what are those habitat patches that can also serve as connectors. And so there's been a lot of work to create wildlife crossings. I just put some examples up here. You could have a whole presentation just on this. Um, here's a rendering down in the bottom left corner of a crossing that's designed for Highway 101 in Agora Hills, California. And they're proposing to construct that in the next five years. It's 200 feet long by 165 feet wide. There's also some really great design resources. I provided a link here at the bottom of the slide. So if you want to think about how you might design some of these crossings. And um, here's a little mountain lion baby here on the left. So this little critter can't, can't survive unless we provide ways to move across the landscape. And this was just a fun example I also added in the right of in, in Christmas Island, Australia, they actually have a crab bridge. And the reason they created this bridge for crabs was so bad that they would have to close the road to let the little crabs migrate. And so now they have this crazy crab bridge and it seems to be working quite well. Europe is way ahead of the United States in building wildlife bridges. Uh, and keep in mind, these can also be pathways for people and greenways as well. Uh, but something that uh, the U.S. is doing a lot of research in and, and there's a lot of opportunity and hope for recreating some of those pathways we've lost through highway construction. And of course, you can have tunnels, wildlife tunnels work well as, as also. The federal government, the Highway Administration has created this website called, and, and they also have a book called Ecological. And so that is a wonderful tool that you can also take advantage of. They also have grant funding available to help you if you are interested in learning how to design ecologically sensitive highways. So I'm going to move now and just to some examples so that we can focus on how this works in the real world. So I'm going to take you quickly to South Carolina. Uh, that's one of the many states we've built a habitat model for. And I'm going to zoom into Berkeley County, South Carolina, just outside of Charleston, a rapidly growing community. So how do we look at habitat and connectivity? Well, first, we're going to use the land cover to determine the cores, but we're also going to add other data to that. We're going to look at topographic relief, which provides more biodiversity, the area of surface water. We're going to look at things that fragment it. We're going to look at depth to the interior, to the middle, the species diversity. We're going to look at other data for whether they're rare, threatened, endangered species, and look at how water rich it is, because that also affects the habitat quality as well as the biodiversity that it can support. And so once you create these databases, it, then it becomes really easy to figure out what's going on by using the I tool in GIS to click on the core and learn a lot of the statistics about why that one is important. And so this is how we prioritize, because making a map is one thing, but you can't save everything. All of us have to prioritize, especially if you're doing transportation planning and you're trying to figure out where to put that road. So if we just said we have to save all of that, it wouldn't be practical. So what is the best? So let's begin with the highest ranked. We'll just pull out the top two ranked uh, cores that meet most of our environmental values. Then we'll add in those adjacent cores to buffer them. 
Then we'll ask if they're adjacent to a stream or lake to protect water quality. Then we'll ask if they're already protected by conservation easements, so we might as well add them into the network. And then we'll ask if they're a key connector. Do they form a link between two or other, two or more other cores? And then we'll think about riparian vegetation and supporting that. Then we'll look at risk, because having a map isn't good enough unless you ask what could be damaged. And so we look at, well, what's under easement? That's protected, okay, good. We'll look at wildlife management areas. Those are relatively protected. Then we'll look at U.S. Forest Service land. In this county, they own a big chunk. That's uh, a large, large forest. And active forestry land. And then we did actually meet with the forestry companies to find out if they plan to continue to log it or whether they were going to convert it to subdivision. And then we can look at special risk factors such as impaired waters or risk from fire. So bringing fire into the equation is important because it may be that those places that you want to protect are also good to protect because they have high fire risk and so they're not so safe for people to be living there in the first place. And then we look at development pressures. And so of course distance to major roads is a major growth driver. So we look at that and other things. So we'll walk that through. So we just buffer the roads. The redder the color, the higher the risk. So the closer you are to the road, the more likely that land would develop. Then we look at the growth areas, what is already proposed for growth. Then we look at existing cities and towns, which also might be growth drivers. Existing development, so where has development already occurred? What is already zoned for residential development? What is zoned for planned unit development? And then where are all the parcels that are small? Smaller the parcel, the more likely it is to develop. So you have to define small for your area. It might be different for Montana than it would be for, say, um, Massachusetts. Okay. And then we put that all together, and this gives us our risk map, sort of a heat map showing you the more yellow, orange, or red the colors, the more at risk those areas are. And that helps to tell us where to focus our efforts. And then we can take out the conservation areas as not being at risk. And we look at a network of intact, connected landscapes with our highest priorities and also where we should focus our efforts if we need to seek conservation easements. So ranking our assets and determine opportunities. We can also look at this from a larger scale saying how does that, those large patches of habitat connect throughout the region and work with our neighboring counties to try to protect those areas. And then implementation. And I don't have time today to go into a lot of implementation, but um, we'll do things such as here's a uh, Highway 52, and then we'll say here's the big habitat core, and there's some parcels here. So if these develop, we would want to maybe work with those landowners to see if we could designate the back portion of some of these long parcels that go into our core as perhaps open space. So you think, I can't do this model. How do I do this? Well, the good news is you don't have to because we partnered with Esri, and we gave them our script, and we worked together to create a national map of habitat cores for the entire United States. So you can uh, go to Esri, you can just Google Esri Green Infrastructure if you like and you'll get to their website. And then you can actually type in your watershed or your county or an address and it will take you to your area. So I picked an area in California and then you can see some of the statistics it generates, how it compares to other areas. And then if you have GIS skills, you can also download the data for your state or your county and go to town. That's where you then add in your local data, such as your transportation plan. It's already been analyzed for whether things are being fragmented, but you'll add in your local data, known endangered species. Let's say you're working on a greenway plan. Anything that's important to you, that's where you can work to prioritize it. And you can use the steps that we list in the uh, strategic green infrastructure planning book to make your plan. So if we're in an urban landscape, I'm going to switch now to an urban landscape because it's a different kettle of fish, if you will. We don't have big 100-acre habitat cores usually in the middle of cities, so uh, we have to think about trees and woodlots, habitat patches, streams and wetlands, smaller parks, but we can still connect to larger networks. And we're going to think about Transportation also defined as trails, and so this is an example of Lynchburg, Virginia near us where they have bikes that you can um, just take, check out and ride for free. And a lot of people use their trail network to commute to work. So canopy is a key thing to analyze at the urban scale. 
And so what we have to do is take satellite imagery. And again, if you uh, are interested, we, we do get the free information from the National Agricultural Imagery Project. And we then classify that imagery so that we can know what is a tree, what is a wetland, what's the building. We classify the land cover. And that tells us what we have and where it's at. And so this is uh, just a quick thing of supervised classification. We have to teach the computer to recognize these features. So I'll take you through quickly Charlottesville, Virginia. That's where I'm talking to you from today. We have a trail that rings the city and provides a little bit of country experience in the city. So how do we make sense of the city? How do we look at it? Well, here's just an aerial image. That doesn't tell us a whole lot. And we can look at our gray infrastructure network. But if we have land cover, we now have the tree canopy, the streams, the marshes, which we have some. And we ask, how does this turn into a, a strategy? So looking at our tree canopy, this is everything that's forested. But you'll see a lot of white gaps in the downtown. We can then say, where are our key open spaces? Those can be nodes, places that people want to get to, move themselves to. What is the trail network in the city? We can add in the existing trail network in orange. We can then say, where are the chunks of large tree patches? So we have to decide what's a good size for a patch in our city. And then what we did, these little green dots, these threads, these are where the city said, we want these to be connector streets. And so we said, OK, Charlottesville, why don't we make them green streets? Because it turns out that people are more likely to walk bike or move along green streets. And so these now, even though they didn't have a lot of green in the downtown, this becomes their network. These are the green infrastructure. And these streets will be um, greened with extra trees. They might have bio swales to catch stormwater. They might have more bike lanes, all of these things, so that people can move across the city and still have that feeling of green. And here's an example um, of what that might mean on a project that I actually worked on. Uh, here was a street that was super wide. So this street went all the way to this telephone pole and out to here. So we actually cut, cut out a lane here and planted. We cut, created this buffer here. Um, here's another example of a bump out that we designed. And we're now going to another part of the neighborhood, more uh, vegetated margins in the street, bumped out areas and planted wildflower meadows and trees. So what we've done is we took an area where we had a very high speeding problem and we got rid of that speeding problem and turned into a pedestrian area. And what was really neat was that we worked then with local uh, owners to get these vacant buildings to be occupied. So nobody, we had a lot of vacancy there before. It was a blighted area. And now it's uh, active and vibrant. It's considered the hip, cool place to be in town now. Um, but it wasn't like that before. It was vacant, neglected, and full of speed cars, that is. So uh, another example quickly is River Bluff. This is another example in Charlottesville. And what I wanted to point out about this one was they wanted to conserve open space. And so we worked with them to ensure that they have a one-way road. And that allowed them to have a nice skinny road so that they could have less pavement. That also means the road is moving a little slower. And then this is what's along that road. This is what really makes it a green road. Not just that it's on a diet and it's skinny, but this is the bioswale. So water comes off the road and goes through these cells and settles and the plants clean the water and then it overflows through this little notch and settles and cleans some more. So by the time that water from that road comes out of the other end, you could probably drink it. They also conserved uh, 15 acres of forest and wetland. So they made their development footprint small, and that's probably the, one of the most popular neighborhoods in the city to live in. Quickly, a new project I want to tell you about um, that we are working with cities on to try to help them use their urban forest to manage stormwater. We're working in six states and 12 cities, from large cities to mountains to the coast. We're trying to help localities understand the role that green infrastructure plays in flood management. And uh, just quickly, this is a picture on a typical day in Charleston, South Carolina, just an afternoon rainstorm, not a big flood. And you can see how that is destroying the road network and impeding safety. Trees are the best green infrastructure, better than anything we can design. 
So I like bioswales, but if I can save the trees first, that's the most effective thing to do. One tree can take up to 3,000 or 4,000 gallons of water per year per tree. But we have to accommodate these tree trees because otherwise we're causing transportation problems for our pedestrians, right? We all have trees like this in our community. So how can we first put the right species for that space, give it enough room, and then in areas where we want to put larger trees and maybe we don't have a lot of room, we can use things such as suspended pavements and silva cells, which is a trade name, but it's a type of structure that allows that tree root to be supported out here. And we can also direct those roots away from utilities. Okay, so mapping urban canopy, as we do this work, we actually get down to the one meter scale and we ask, is the tree over a lawn a parking lot? Is it a street tree or is it in the natural forest? Because the setting in which the tree sets affects how much water it can soak up. And then we ask, where can we fit more trees? And when we do this mapping, for those of you who are always worried about, as you're working in streets, that you have all these conflicts with utilities and vegetation, we make sure that we avoid those conflicts. So we include underground utilities in our evaluation of where trees can go. We also try to avoid overhead wires. And we also look at where tree canopy is distributed because it's not distributed evenly. It can be very low in the downtown where we need that economic development. And we look at the structure, the watershed, the rainfall, all of that to calculate how much water is falling off and flowing and how much is getting absorbed. And don't want you to uh, try to decipher this clip of a spreadsheet. All I wanted to tell you with this is we now have a calculator tool we've developed. So once you've mapped your canopy, you can actually calculate how much water the trees are taking up and how much is running off. And then you can also calculate how much more water you could soak up if you planted trees as well as how much water might be entering your streets and your storm drains uh, if you lose canopy. So it's a tool of analysis that you can use for planning. So the question is how do we make a city function like a forest? We are also doing audits of policies and codes to figure out whether our codes allow too much impervious area and whether we're managing our green infrastructure well. We have a spreadsheet from HEC, but we make that, it will make that available free to anyone who wants to have that spreadsheet and you can perform your uh, audit on yourself. And so here's an example of uh, what it might tell you. For example, maybe you have excessive parking um, standards. We might say, well, could you actually have a parking maximum? Could you also play with variable space sizing? Could you put biofiltration in your parking lot? So you can have parking lot, you can have these features, if you drive cars and, and ride bikes, you need somewhere to park them, right? But can we make that area a green space? Uh, and as I said, in the city of Hot Springs, they've actually realized some of their parking lots they didn't need and they turned them into urban parks. So, of course, avoid that, have accommodation. So, in conclusion, we hope everyone will realize the importance of mapping the most important habitats and assets first. Then plan for roads to avoid them and enjoy them. Consider ways to reduce pavement. Shrink your footprints. Could that be a one-way road? Could it be narrower? Could you use that right-of-way to put a bioswale? Reduce the amount of parking. Keep cities cooler and save money. Map and then plan to plant trees in cities to add shade, clean the air, improve the economy, and calm traffic. And I didn't really talk a lot about this, but trees calm traffic by creating visual stimuli that cause people to drive more slowly. They're more effective than putting up lots of stop signs. And lastly, be a multimodal planner. Transportation is for everyone, so we want to move people, animals, and pollinators in creative ways. So with that, I'll end. That's the Angel Oak in Charleston, South Carolina. It's many hundreds of years old. It's kind of a become a sacred site. I'll see if anyone has any questions. Well, Professor Firehawk, thank you so much. This has been greatly appreciated. Uh, a lot of good information. Um, I have two quick questions. So you mentioned the term green infrastructure came from Florida, um, as well yeah. you mentioned smart growth. And Andros Dwayne, the author of the Smart Growth uh, Manual, is actually a planner 
uh, from Florida. So I'm just curious, is, has Florida been a leader in green infrastructure practices? Yes, they have. And one thing I, I didn't get to show you today was they've actually been working on, I have, a, I have another book coming out uh, where I talk about this, but uh, they've actually been working on a wildlife corridor across the state. And so they're trying to maneuver those issues of how do they move wildlife across multiple counties and then get under, over, around the road network. And so um, they've got a wildlife map and they've been doing all these uh, hikes and charrettes and workshops trying to figure out how to bridge those gaps, literally. Uh, and so uh, the one of the challenges I would say that Florida has is that um, their government keeps changing. And so fortunately we have the university there to support the green network and do the work. So as administrations change from one party to another, uh, they've been able to sustain their work. And so I guess that's a, a good plug for universities, why it's so important to have uh, the private sector involved in the work, not just the government. So one last question for me as well. Um, I, we haven't received any inquiries at this point, but you mentioned about uh, the Federal Highway Administration putting out a publication of this nature. And it seems yes. as though uh, USDOT has also put out some information uh, for this, which is good that the federal level, this has been promulgated. But I'm just curious, what do you think will probably be the breaking point for the planning, transportation planning profession to realize, okay, green infrastructure planning and design really needs to be the future? I think that, that a lot of that leadership is going to come, come from local people. It really needs to be something that the community explains. We need to protect this resource. This resource is important to us. Uh, we had this issue here in Charlottesville area where our reservoir was threatened by a highway that was going to go right over our drinking water supply. And it took a lot of concerted effort for the community to say, no, drinking water is more important to us. And why don't we go do some retrofits on our main road to create underpasses and make that road work better rather than putting at risk water supply for more than 100,000 people. So I think it's that having those maps and having that ready, not waiting for the five-year transportation plan to come out, but actually going ahead and pull down your ESRI map now and start looking at that and then bringing uh, that into the, the conversation about where future roads might go. And also think creatively, of course, about how to move people. Um, Sometimes we realized a road wasn't necessary when we looked at other transportation options, um, such as, you know, trains, um, bike lanes, carpools, all of those other ways. Also, smart planning, um, as we talked about smart growth, uh, allowing people to telecommute or building things closer to where people live so that we don't have to spend so much time moving them around. Was there any other questions at this point from any attendees? Okay, seeing none, again, I want to thank you so much for your presentation today. Incredibly informative and very important. Um, Jen, did you have anything you wanted to add? Uh, thank you. I learned a lot and um, Island Press is very grateful for the work that you've done, Professor Firehawk. So thank you and please go grab her book. All right, thank you. And this information, the webinar and uh, the PowerPoints will be uploaded to our website soon and we'll uh, send that out as well for other individuals to access it. So again, Professor Firehawk, thank you so much. We appreciate that. And uh, we do know that this is your publication, landmark publication, the Strategic Green Infrastructure Planning is our book choice for Transportica's uh, book club and also if you were to go online to Island's website, uh, there is a 40% discount available if you purchase it using the word multi-scale. Yep. So again, thank yep, you for so much. You <laughs> we appreciate this, thank you again. All right, everyone get outside and go hug a tree. <laughs> <laughs> we're doing that right now. <laughs> Excellent, <laughs> it's good for your health. Cheers. All right. Thank you again. Have a wonderful day. You too. Bye.